welcome to our time of study this Thursday evening as we continue to look into God's Word in this series of studies we are doing on snapshots of faith and love in the Old Testament. As you who have been following along will know that our primary character that we're dealing with right now is, is uh, this man known as the friend of God and the father of faith, Abraham. Tonight we'll be looking at a study which I've entitled Things to Laugh About. Well, you need to stay with me to figure out what we mean by that. It's from Genesis chapter 17, and we'll be reading that in just a moment. But first, let's bow our heads before the Lord. Father, we submit our thoughts and our lives to you again. Lord, we thank you for your grace to us, your mercy extended to us this very day. You've been good to us, Lord. You continue to hear our prayers. You have answered many prayers in ways that have just lifted our spirits. And some of the answers, Father God, uh, were not what we wanted or expected because you know better, always. But so many of them, Lord God, we have just had to look back and say, thank you, God, for your goodness to us. We pray that you would guide and direct our time together here as we study God's word, and that you would help us uh, to be able to glean from your word what we need to hear so that we might be blessed, encouraged, strengthened, and built up. In Christ's name, amen. From the 17th chapter of Genesis, I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. When Abram was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your so sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep, between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and who, who, he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. 
When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. All the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Well, as I said, I've titled this uh, text, this lesson, this study together, Things to Laugh About. But actually, it's a very deep and profound uh, uh, lesson before us. And so we're not laughing at the lesson. It's just that uh, there is a thought connected to laughter that goes beyond simply laughing. But I think that Abraham must have shaken his head many times over the years at the irony of his name. You know, exalted father. As he and, and his wife, Sarah, Sariah then, passed the typical years of having children and raising a family, Abraham must have struggled not only with the seeming irony of his name, but also at why God's insistent, insistence that his name would have actual fulfillment seemed absolutely too unlikely in the normal run of things. That's why it would, would, would have been pretty easy for Abraham to give in to Sarai's suggestion about having a child by Hagar, her servant girl. You know he did give in. But in verse 5 of Genesis 17, which we just read, God comes to Abraham, his name is still Abram, with a proposal that from a human point of view appears to elevate the irony of his name to an embarrassing level. God tells him that his name will no longer be Abram, which means exalted father, but Abraham, father of a multitude. Now, one of the things about dealing with God that we, we see so vividly here in this text is that, that when God speaks about something that he's going to do, he often presents it as an accomplished reality. He tells Abram that not only is he God, changing Abram's name, but the reason that he's doing it is because, as he says, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I have made you. That's past tense. Well, so far in this story, Abraham, or Abram has one son, Ishmael, born to Hagar. Uh, we know from reading ahead, so... Of course, you do that sometimes, don't you? Read ahead. That Abram, and I guess we can start calling him Abraham, okay? That, that Abram is breathing a little easier now because he has a son. And so his eyes are on what he sees. His eyes are on the temporal, what is a physical reality. But God has something more in mind than that when God says, I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. Now, you will have understood that God has been testing Abram's faith from day one. And clearly, the birth of Ishmael was not in the realm of the supernatural. We know that. An area that, that required Abraham to believe God alone to make it happen. No. What happened with the birth of Ishmael? This was off the flesh. And so 13 years after Ishmael is born, God appears again to a 99-year-old Abraham and says to him, I am a God Almighty. That word in the Hebrew is El Shaddai. El Shaddai. I'm God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. And God continues to, to outline to Abraham both the benefits of blessing or the benefits, all the, all the blessings of this covenant and its single requirement. As part of that covenant, covenants have benefits and requirements, benefits and obligations. And see, he outlines to Abraham the benefit of this covenant. 
but also the single requirement, and you see that from verses 4 to 14, all this, that, this next dialogue that goes on which God speaks of the benefits and he speaks of the one requirement. Now, putting yourselves or ourselves in the place of Abram at that moment, with him now having a 13-year-old son, we can imagine that Abraham is, is neither overly concerned about this promise, nor is he likely anticipating what God is going to tell him next, beginning in verse 15. So when God tells him that Sarai is going to bear him a son, in verse 18 we read Abraham's response. He says, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God's response to Abraham is a very solid and maybe a very loud no. He says, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. But, you know, reading that far ahead is getting too far ahead of where we are. We get back to verse 15. There God tells Abraham that he has changed Sarai's name to Sarah. So not only has God changed Abraham, changed his name from exalted father to father of a multitude, but he has changed Sarai's name as well. If you were to look up th these two names in a concordance, uh, in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, you would see, from a, as far as your perspective is, you would see ex the, the exact Hebrew letters in both names. And yet, Hebrew scholars are able to discern the very significant change that occurs with, with a subtle addition. Just as by adding the same letter to Sarai's name that was added to Abram's name, there's a change of status. The Hebrew letter that is added is the consonant He. That's equivalent to our letter H in the English. This letter appears twice in God's name, Yahweh. In fact, uh, you would see it written out, you will see just the consonants Y-H-W-H. -H. The vowels A and E are added. So twice in God's name, Yahweh, or Yahweh, I suppose it could be, but really, we, we have come to accept it as being Yahweh. This uh, tet tetragrammaton, as it's referred to, the God's name, that's the name that the Jews were quite often not very willing to say in case they took his name in vain. Anyway, you would see that some commentators would, would in fact, including some Hebrew scholars, would they have said that, that what God was doing was adding a part of his name to both Abram's and Sarah's names. No wonder we can say that he was elevating their, their status. He was elevating their names. He was elevating their status. In, in this covenant that God was initiating, he was giving to both Abraham and Sarah a permanent connection with him through their names. But what he was doing was adding a letter of his name to their names. And so in the future, God would also be identifying himself by his covenant connection with Abraham. He will be referring to himself as the God of Abraham. And so you have this, this transaction in which, in a sense, God says, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to identify you by a part of my name, and I'll be identified by you by your name. So we have this... this uh, addition to Abraham's name and to Sarai's name, changing their names and changing the significance and the meanings, really, of their names. Now, Hebrew scholars have pointed out that the name Sarai is really an adjective, meaning princely one, whereas Sarah is a noun, meaning princess. So just as Abraham himself the person is at the center of this new covenant between God and Abraham's descendants. Sarah is now included as well by this designation of her being a princess. I suppose the point here that needs to be borne in mind is that, that whether or not she ever had a child, God viewed her as a person, as a person, as an individual, as one who was royalty in his eyes. She was a she was a princely or a princess-like woman in his eyes, in his eyes, regardless whether she had a child or not. Now, 
That doesn't change. That fact, the way God viewed her as a person, does not change with this new designation associated with a name change. What is now added is a new status, one that could only become a reality when she becomes a mother. Her change of name did not take anything away from her. It rather added another significant dimension to her and to her person. Her status is changed. So even though the particular covenant that God had laid out before Abraham would be one that, that its sign in, in Sarah's male descendants, his sign would be found only in Sarah's male descendants alone. But Sarah was not excluded from this covenant. In fact, without her participation, this covenant would have no fulfillment. Look at what God says about her in verse 16. He says, I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. And by the way, that phrase, I will give you a son by her, in the Hebrew, it is literally, I have given you a son by her. Again, as we noted earlier, God speaks of the future as an accomplished and finished reality. And in so doing, God wants Abraham to, to take this point of view as well, to see the promises of God, because they're made by God, as completed realities. And you know, my brothers and sisters, that's the same for us. We need to read God's Word, and when we read God's Word today, we read it in a time of great turmoil, when it seems that the church in many quarters is failing and descending into spiritual decline. Men and women that we looked up to with great admiration have failed us and caused grief to each of us who has heard of their failures. These failures have further tarnished the name and the image of the Western Church to the point where many will no longer want or wish to associate with it. But, my dear brothers and sisters, we have, we have read the Word. We know that it has told us that in the last days perilous times would come, and that many would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, and that before Christ returns there would come a great falling away. But we are nevertheless encouraged to remain faithful even unto the end. For the victory is still Christ's. The Lamb will conquer, or we can say, as God speaks to Abraham, as something completed, the Lamb has conquered. God has spoken of the end as an accomplished reality. Praise Him, because He is still Lord of Lords. Now back to verse 16. So here we are connecting the thought that Sarah's new status, signified in her name change, is borne out by what God says, by what God says about her. She shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. She's royalty. Royalty indeed, because God has connected her with himself. Now, I'm sure that you cannot help but notice the fact that it is only after God changes both Abraham and Sarah's names by adding a letter of his name to theirs that his promise is given a specific time for fulfillment. What might be the significance of adding this particular sound to their names? It's from the name Yahweh, yes. But it's also part of the word for spirit or breath, the Hebrew word ruach. It is the spirit that gives life. Jesus says that in John's Gospel. In some sense, God was breathing new, miraculous life into an old couple, and it is his spirit that would make this conception and this birth possible. Clearly, clearly, this, the birth of the son, this one whose name means laughter, is a miraculous event. And God does it. The God who spoke the universe into existence when there was no universe. And the Spirit of God that was hovering over the waters 
is the same God that speaks about things that are not as if they were because he brings them into reality. When Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. There was power, creative, miraculous power in Jesus' words. And so when God has spoken to Abraham and says, I have changed your name, I have added a sound from a letter from my name to yours, and I have changed Sarah's, Sarai's name, I've added a letter from my name to hers. And now I'm telling you that she is going to bear a son. That letter that is added there is not just from the name Yahweh, but it's also part of the word for the Spirit of God, the Ruach of God, the Spirit that gives life making life possible all the time. But in this case, miraculous life is made possible. Now, God makes this declaration to Abraham, and Abraham's response to God's declaration, that's what it was, it wasn't just a promise. Abraham's response was to fall on his face a second time, but this time he falls on his face and he laughs. And he says to himself, he's probably shaking his head from side to side in amazement, and possibly some degree of doubt, because his two questions focus not on who could or who would make this happen, but on the, his questions focus on the natural and the physical realities that seem to him insurmountable. He asks the questions, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? Yes. Sometimes the things that God declares to us just seem beyond possibility. So we suggest to God an alternative. Abraham does that in verse 18, which we alluded to earlier. He says, and, and the text says, And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Somehow or another, he's not hearing what God says. <laughs> but God hasn't spoken beyond what God could deliver. It's not like, God is not like some of the modern-day prophets who were decreeing and declaring that the recent U.S. elections would have a different outcome. What God spoke as spoke about, what he, what he declared as something that was a done, finished deal, well, it was as good as done in time as it was established already in eternity. Verse 19, God says, No. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, which means, of course, laughter. He laughs. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. And just to, I guess shall we say, rub it in a little, God tells Abraham that the name he will give his yet-to-be-conceived and yet-to-be-born son is Isaac, which means he laughs. Now, later on, we see that Abraham's response was identical to Sarah's when she gets the same declaration from God. But just like God gives a name of significance to both Abraham and Sarah on the same day, he promises a son to them whose name will mean for, for them far more than the fact that they, they laughed when they hear or when they heard about something that was difficult for them both to conceive as reality. This name also signifies something else. Laughter. He laughs. Abraham laughs. Sarah laughs. But laughter is associated not just with incredulity, but it's, an, it's associated with joy, with happiness signifies the laughter of happiness with both the birth of his son and for the God who gives laughter, who gives satisfaction as part of his covenant promise to each of them 
and to all of us. Well, now as we close this study together, we need to note that with this encounter, God gives Abraham more than a promise regarding some uncertain time in the future. Previously, God told him he was going to be, you know, he could look up at the heavens and he could see the stars. He's going to have, and Abraham said, but you know, I don't have a son. I don't have a descendant. I have a servant. And Eliezer of Damascus, and God says, no, no, it'll be your own son. And then, of course, Sarah says, look, this is not working out. I'm just too old. How about going into Hagar, my servant, and um, she'll be your second wife, and she'll conceive, and then maybe I'll have a son by her. But that was in the flesh. It was all of the flesh. The results were fleshly. God says, no, that's not my plan. Changing your name, Sarah's name, changing your circumstances. And I'm entering a covenant with you. And the beginning of this covenant, the ending of this covenant, will contain one thing. God is a miracle-working God. And so, God gives Abraham now a very specific time in the future. God tells him he can anticipate something with a specific time frame attached to it. I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Verse 21. This time next year. Those words must have echoed in Abraham's mind and showed up in his dreams night after night for many weeks, maybe for the next almost a year. I suppose the faith journey question that we must contemplate is whether this specific promise stayed in the forefront of Abraham's mind as he considered the physical realities of his age and the post-menopausal wife. Now, at some point, because we're going to be that time next year, a year is a little longer than nine months, sometime before the year is over, Abraham will realize, wow, something is working. And the only thing that could be is the power of God. God promised and God delivered. Despite the physical realities of Abraham's age and his post-menopausal wife. But you see, the battle is won or lost in the mind before it becomes a reality to us. Many times we give up on God. What would Abraham trust in more? What his eyes could see or the words he heard spoken by God. And that's still the case today for you and me, for our faith journey, isn't it? Well, the Apostle Paul states as a fact, he says that we walk by faith and not by sight, is for most of us still an aspiration rather than a reality. We quote the text, but we're still learning because walking this faith journey, not just a uh, Faith, uh, snapshots of faith and love uh, in the Old Testament that has this element here of, of being a journey. It's also the journey for us. But as we said, as with Abraham, so it is with us. So is it with us. We are on a faith journey in our relationship with El Shaddai, God Almighty. And this God never lies. This God never fails to keep what he declares to be a finished reality when he declares it to us. He is always true, always true to his covenant. That's the God that we serve. I trust that we understand that and we appreciate the fact that God is, well, what do we say? God who keeps his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The word that spoke, let there be light, is the word that spoke to Abraham 
and said, this time next year you will have a son. You are to name him Isaac. You will laugh at his birth, just as you laughed when you heard that Sarah was going to conceive. He will be the son that brings you joy. And by him, and by his descendants, I will bless all the nations of the world. Well, one sig significant descendant of Abraham has brought a blessing to all of us, and that is Yeshua, salvation. That's the name of Jesus. He is our Lord and our Savior. A descendant by flesh, in the flesh by, from Abraham. But far more than that, he preceded Abraham. He himself said, before Abraham was, I am. Praise God for this. Amen.